The Mystic Knight vocation seems to have this quirky habit of strapping atomic bombs to their shields, so when they perfect block, they take no damage and dissolve the insides of their enemies at the same time, which is why I'm going to beat the whole game with just perfect blocks. Perfect blocking is super strong after all. This challenge run should be very easy. I can't imagine struggling with it at all. Here are the rules. We can only perfect block, no attacking, no throwing, not even punching. Weapons that aren't shields or magic shields can't be equipped. We can't use attacking skills with shields, only repulse and other blocking skills. Vocations that can't use shields are allowed, but I can't attack with them. We'll be playing on hard mode, pawns are banned, and we can't resurrect ourselves with wake stones. While we're at it, let's ban all consumables, including curatives and stat boosters. This run won't be much of a challenge unless I ban these overpowered items. It's now illegal. We must beat the main quest line and kill both daemon forms in order to complete the run. You might be wondering how I kept my sanity during this challenge run, and it's all thanks to today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends, for covering my therapy bill. Raid is the most epic, Poggers-based Kino turn-based RPG of all time. You can play it on PC or even your phone to keep you company while you're pooping. The character designs go pretty hard. Let's rate some of them. 8 out of 10, 7 out of 10, 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10, husband out of 10. You should join my clan by the way, it's called the Porn Guild. Raid's introduced a new feature called the Cursed City. It's got over 100 stages and you have to fight two bosses at the same time so it's sure to make you shiver your timbers. You can even get a mythic champion and these guys are tripped out. God damn. You were alone on Valentine's Day, weren't you? Sorry, that was probably too forward, but it's okay. Raid Shadow Legends will help numb the pain. For a limited time, new players can get four free characters. Using the promo code GETOBERO, you can get Obero, an epic rank champion. Her design is very sophisticated, and her high attack scaling means she'll carry you for a large chunk of the game. With the code Raid War Maiden, you can get, you guessed it, War Maiden. If you haven't played Raid yet, then click my link in the description or scan the QR code to get two free epic rarity heroes, Light Sworn, followed by Juliana after hitting level 15. Lightsworn is a great support with defense buffs and revival skills, meanwhile Julian is a great damage dealer. Did I say they were handing out four free champions? It's actually five. Use the promo code I love Ray to get Preserver for free. After clicking my link in the description, find me under the name Infinite Cringe and make sure to join my clan or else. Thank you Raid for sponsoring this video, now let's get back to the challenge. In my previous challenge run, Fireboy from Cool Maths Games was the star of the show. It's only natural that we now play as Water Girl. Water Girl is birthed into the world and immediately slapped by a dragon, which kickstarts the game. Our start of vocation is fighter because it's the best. Water Girl gets rid of her sword, leaving only her shield equipped. As a fighter, we can't perfect block until we purchase the Deflect Core skill at rank 3, so we don't have access to damage at this point of the game. There are currently three side quests in Cassidus, and none of them require combat. I completed Grim Tidings just by talking to people. Then Watergirl employed her parkour skills to finish Lost Scriptures, and we collected flowers for Benita in floral delivery. It was time to head to the encampment. On the way there, I got hide armor and an iron shield. That's so poggies. After arriving at the encampment, we get to battle a Cyclops. I lure the goblins over to the burning crate so they set themselves on fire. I was rewarded with XP as they burned alive. Then in a masterful display of pure skill and competence, I fell off the cliff and barely survived. The Cyclops thought my demonstration was so amazing that it decided to emulate me, but I forgot to do the part where you survive. Even with the Cyclops and Goblins slain, I still don't have enough discipline to unlock perfect blocking. It's time for Water Girl to make her pawn, and Fireboy is once again birthed into the world. Happy birthing, Fireboy. We headed back to Castus and Aura appeared at the docks. Water Girl killed Fireboy and went to Bitter Black Isle with Aura's help. We proceeded into Dustmoon Tower, where we meet Best Boy Barok. In the Dark Arisen version of Dragon's Dogma, we're given DLC items straight away that we can sell for lots of money. I avoided selling these items, and chose to pretend that they don't exist, to avoid ruining the early game economy and gear progression. Now that we're in Duskmoon, I proceeded to ruin the early game economy and gear progression. Water Girl grabbed a barrel and used it to break the space-time continuum, acquiring a Ring of Perseverance. This ring boosts your discipline earned by 50%. I want to unlock perfect blocking as quickly as possible so I can finally get this challenge run started, because frankly speaking, this has been more of a pacifist run so far than a parry-only challenge. There are high-value equipment pieces located behind the other doors, but I decided to ignore them to avoid making this challenge too easy. After getting the ring, I swapped the game to normal mode, went to the main menu, then picked hard mode again from there. This resets my quest and world progress, while letting me keep my experience and equipment. 
The story has reset, so I went back to the encampment to fight the Cyclops again, getting some more XP. I killed Fireboy once again and finished off the side quest in Cassidus. At this point, I had enough discipline to purchase Mystic Knight. Fighter may be my favourite vocation, but Mystic Knight will definitely have an easier time with this challenge. Not only does Mystic Knight's perfect blocks deal more damage, but they even get bonus parry frames, for some reason. It's back to Bit of Black Isle, where I purchased Wooden Wall from Barak. While she's in Dust Moon, Water Girl grabs yet another Ring of Perseverance, doubling the amount of discipline she earns. I did some more exploration, grabbing macabre sculptures and convincing these spiders to take a bath. Then these skeletons are a bit silly and accidentally hit an explosive barrel. That's so crazy. I wonder how that happened. The big skeleton is scary, so I live stoned out and return to Krancis. I need rank 3 and Mystic Knight to unlock Reflect, so we can finally start parrying in this parry-only challenge run. Watergirl found some wolves near the encampment. Wolves sometimes like running off cliffs, which is very quirky and strange. After enough wolves gods bane themselves, she reached rank 3 and Mystic Knight, and we unlocked Reflect. The challenge run has officially started. Our next goal is to head to Grand Sorum to unlock Fast Travel, but first we have to fend off a Hydra attack, and just as this challenge run got started, it immediately immediately stopped. The Hydra only does grab attacks, which can't be perfect blocked, and if I can't perfect block, I can't damage the enemy. During the second phase of the fight, it will very rarely do an actual attack, which is blockable, but my shield is too garbage to land a proper riposte against it. It's imperative that we get a better shield. My shield of choice for early game is the Blue Kite Shield. This shield has 70 more guard rating than Wooden Wall, and looks way drippier. Merchants don't sell this shield until right before you fight the dragon, but there are several ways to get it earlier than that. You can get Blue Kite in the Gutter of Misery, which isn't that far into Bitter Black. I head back to BBI and make my way to the Midnight Helix. By some miracle, I manage to grab the Void Key at the top of the tower and frantically lift Stone back out. The key can unlock the Shrine of Futile Truths, which leads into the Gutter of Misery. Now that we're here, I head over to Chest 7. Some pesky Elite Worms try to get in my way, and they do, but after some perfect blocks, I'm free to loot in peace. I eventually got the Blue Kite Shield to drop after three reloads. Before I fight the Hydra again, I purchased the Augment Periphery. According to the game code, this Augment boosts your guard rating by 50. So does it add an additional flat 50 to your guard rating, or does it increase your guard rating by 50%? I, uh, don't know. But basically, we shouldn't have any trouble with perfect blocking for quite some time. It's time to fight the Hydra again. The Blue Kite with Periphery is able to perfect block the Hydra's attacks. While having a shiny new shield is great, the Hydra still takes longer to attack than the birth of a new star. Water Girl sits around and waits for the Hydra to do something that isn't a grab. By the time that it finally does, a new solar system has formed. I can now perfect block the attack, making his head fucking explode. I've actually never seen this cutscene in this lighting because it never takes this long to complete the Hydra quest. Gamers, it is time for the best quest in the game. Normally the Ox quest can be sped up really easily using Mage's healing spells, but that's not an option here. The Ox quest will be slow for this run, and I have come to terms with that. It's a slow but oddly peaceful walk to Grand Sorin. Now that we're in Grand Sorin, we've unlocked fast travel, but I'll need a port crystal first to get any use out of it. The next main quest is Lure of the Abyss, which lets you collect a port crystal. How convenient. I head down to the Everfall, as my home dog Barney requested, and... Oh, that's a long way down. Our current limitations prevent us from surviving if we just jump to the bottom, so we'll have to take the long way. It wasn't too long though, because I phased through the gate using barrels and pulled the lever on the other side. After nearly dying to some bats, Water Girl collects the poor crystal, examines the thingy Barney was talking about, and teleports back out, completing the quest. Having no curatives is a little inconvenient, so let's alleviate this problem a bit. While I was in Bitter Black earlier, I picked up the notice board quest, An Unseen Rival 1. If we kill the Gore Cyclops in the Soulflayer Canyon, we can get the Immortal's Helm. This helmet gives passive health regeneration, and more importantly, looks fantastic. We head to the Great Wall. The walk is long, just like my dick, and I placed a poor crystal outside the Great Wall for later. Soulflayer Canyon was just off to the side, so I headed in and saw the Gore Cyclops on a very stable looking brick. <gasps> We have our hat now, which means I won't have to deal with the low health filter as often. It's back to Grand Sorin, and I talk to my boy Max, accepting the quests of the Cypher and a fortress besieged. I did the Cypher first by heading straight to Hill Figanol, spoke to the Dragon Forged, relieved him of all his earthly possessions, and completed the quest. I placed down the poor crystal I stole from him right outside his cave, then made my way to the Shadow Fort. We have two options. I take the long way around to the Shadow Fort, or fight my way through the ancient quarry to unlock the shortcut. I decided on the latter option because it sounds more fun. 
It wasn't. Going into the quarry, Watergirl actually managed to kill the Yogas with surprisingly little problem. Investing in a shield with high guard rating early on was a good move. Her damage is still quite low at this stage however, so the Ogres take a while to kill, but perfect blocking them is incredibly easy. The most difficult part of this dungeon was not falling asleep. With the Ogres dead, we head outside and purchase some new skills at the rest camp. There was a drake right outside the shadow fort and my level 28 arse was ready to throw hands with it. There is a highly advanced perfect block tactic you can use on lesser dragons, which I like to call lefty righty. You run to one of their arms, perfect block their backhand, then sprint to the opposite arm, perfect block their backhand again, and you alternate between them. Perfect block the left arm, perfect block the right arm, the left arm, the right arm. This lets you get repost off incredibly quickly and makes the drake look very stupid. When they start flapping their wings, that's just a repost buffet. After bullying the drake for a couple of minutes, it proceeds to fly off into the distance with three health bars remaining. I think the psychological torment was too much for it. We enter the shadow fort, and the reason I picked this quest over an easier one is because it's got a port crystal. I disarmed the ballistas by perfect blocking them with lightning, picked up the port crystal and grabbed the lever. After opening the gates, the soldiers ran in and we did some fighting. I mainly just loitered around, waiting for an enemy to attack me. Then I got a cutscene which I had never seen before. It was caused by Sir Robert dying. Then I'm told to report our defeat. I didn't even know you could fail the shadow fort. I decided to go through with it because I already got my port crystal, which is the only reason I came here in the first place, and I definitely wanted to see what happens with the sending. I placed a port crystal outside the fort, then teleported back to Grand Sorin. Max isn't all that bothered by our loss, and the quest completes as usual. The only real difference is that the Shadow Fort won't be a safe zone anymore. I turned in the Cypher quest while I was there, and am now granted an audience with the Duke. After some of your usual public humiliation, Aldous asks me to kill a griffin. That doesn't sound too hard. I joined the men hunting the beast, and my damage sucks. Eventually it got bored and flew off to Blue Moon Tower. Time to follow it. I teleported to Hilfiganol and walked to Blue Moon from there. My first instinct was to run past everything once inside, and that goes about as you expect. Instead, I took my time slowly parrying the enemies until they died. With the way clear, the fight with the griffin begins. This is where I begin to panic. I couldn't attack the barricade, that goes against the rules. I started desperately looking for a barrel that I could use to walk through the gate, but there were none nearby. While my brain blue screens, the guards actually end up breaking the barricade on their own, and the fight truly begins. <laughs> Would you believe me if I said that fighting the griffin was harder than the drake? While I will admit I understand dragon movesets better than I do griffins, my shield was doing terrible damage against it, and since I'm playing on hard mode, many attacks do lethal damage at my level. Despite dying a few times beforehand, the griffin was slain, and I spent a few moments looting Blue Moon. I placed the poor crystal outside Blue Moon, and were off to save Fornival from life in prison. Fornival wasn't exactly needed for this run, but he was useful since he sold veterans periaps in post-game. I collected the Chamberlain affidavit, evidence from Jeffrey, Fiedel, and escorted the witness to Grand Sorin. Warneville is a free man, and will ignore that Watergirl rigged the evidence in his favour. We accepted two more requests from Aldous, the first of which being to accompany Mercedes to Windbluff Tower. The soldiers there have been acting a little silly, and this must cease. Mercedes confronts Julian, which isn't looking good for her. They begin to duel, and I wanted to kill Julian so I could get his shield off him. But because attacking is banned, I couldn't aggro him to me. Obstructing his path with my shield was also ineffective, and the duel ended before I could do anything. Thanks for the sword, Mercedes. It will be very useful in my parry-only challenge run. Next up is the Worm King's Ring. Watergirl made her way to the ancient quarry. Salamet was inside, chilling with his homies, but Watergirl parried them all to death. This scared Salamet all the way to Blue Moon Tower. Good thing we placed a poor crystal there already. Getting to Blue Moon was simple, but getting through the bandits proved surprisingly difficult. It turns out that parrying three archers and a bunch of melee bandits all at the same time is a bit challenging. Running past them all wasn't a much easier option, because it was basically the same as begging to be shot in the back. I also couldn't spam healing items and tank all the damage, because curators were against the rules. That's where Holy Fortress came in clutch. This skill basically disintegrates projectiles before they reach you. By keeping my shield turned to the archers, I could slowly and somewhat safely make my way to the top of the tower. I couldn't believe that actually worked, but it was now time to fight Salamet. Salamet was far easier than his bandits. All I did was wait for him to cast a spell, parry it, then he immediately died. We took the Worm King's ring from him and now our cast speed has been reduced by 10%. 
Yes, the ring does work with Mystic Knight. Back in Grand Sorin, I got Mandy Bank to make a forgery of the ring. Then I handed the fake ring to Aldous and kept the real one for myself. We've gotten pretty far into the main quest line at this point, though I don't think I'm actually ready to fight the dragon yet. I go back to Bitter Black Isle to get some better gear, more levels, and an overall impression of how strong I am now. The enemies in BBI have really high defenses for my current equipment. My shield might be due for an upgrade. I even went to confront the gazer to see how my damage looked, and there was literally nothing to look at. Unfortunately, there are no noticeable upgrades I could get without going into post-game or farming purifications in BBI. This meant I had two choices, try to kill Grigori in my current state, or see if I get lucky farming in BBI. The former option seemed far more enticing. Water Girl is out for blood. Dragon Innards will flow down the Tainted Mountain this day, but not before a cockatrice attacks the city. If I were to say we did a terrible job fending it off, that would be an understatement. Water Girl has really begun underperforming as of late, and it has me a little worried for the fight against Grigori. The cockatrice flew off from sheer boredom, and we reported our success to Aldous. The Duke gave us some money before we were sent to kill the Salvation Cultists congregating at the Great Wall. I already had a poor crystal placed outside, so no problem there. Water Girl ran in and avoided whatever enemies she could to preserve her health. The Chimera encounter is a compulsory fight. The lion died first from all the magic being blasted on its face, leaving just the goat and the snake. The goat took magic a lot better than the lion, so it was slow work finishing it off. After it died, Water Girl ran past all the other enemies and killed the skeleton lord with a few blessed reposts. Next up is the white fight, which was very slow. But after several flame repos, we eventually burned them to death. Suddenly, the dragon bursts onto the scene, presenting his signature dish, Zealot Pancakes. The dragon then drops bars and immediately leaves, so I speak to the dragon forged right after. He gives me a dragon leather vest, which is pretty cool. It's now off to the Tainted Mountain. Since I was banned from using curatives, I ran past all the enemies in an attempt to preserve my health. Using the Gore Chimera's Chonk, I got it to push down the four pressure plates, unlocking the door. Our health is actually pretty low, and we're not allowed to heal ourselves with curatives. What a predicament. I proceed to go AFK and let my health regenerate passively thanks to the Immortal's Helm. What's the matter? I'm not using curatives to heal myself. I'm not breaking any rules. Don't be such a baby. While I was waiting for my health to come back, I was attacked by a ferocious hellhound. Thankfully, I managed to escape the vile creature unscathed. After more than 10 minutes of standing still, my health was fully restored, and it was time to confront the dragon. Demon's Wrath was doing pretty well against Grigori, but some issues pop up during the later sections of the fight. There are three compulsory rule breaks. First, you have to shoot Grigori with a ballista to progress into the next phase of the fight, and then, that next phase requires you to light attack him to reach the final phase. At least my light attack didn't deal any damage, but I still hate these gimmicky mechanics that force me to randomly break rules in my challenge runs. The third rule break will get to soon. First, I'll explain how Demon's Wrath works. It's a rather unique parry skill. After casting the skill, you're shield gets this dark aura that tells you how many Demon's Wrath charges it has. Blocking attacks increase the charges, but perfect blocking gives the most charges. The shield charges faster if you block powerful attacks. Once the aura has become noticeably larger, Demon's Wrath is at full charge. You then press the skill again to release your Dark Splooge upon the enemy. Grigori is weak to Dark, which is why I chose Demon's Wrath. The fight seemed pretty easy at first, but Grigori still refused to make things simple. After two health bars were deleted, he enters his fly around and waste your time phase. At first, he just stood on top of the mountain. The game wants you to use these ballista to shoot him down from it, but that wasn't necessary. While it wasn't possible to beat this parry only challenge without breaking a few rules, I at least wanted to minimize the rule breaking as much as physically possible. I waited for him to get down from the mountain on his own. Eventually he did, in which he began hovering over Water Girl and blasting down fire. You're expected to shoot him down using Ballista or your own ranged attacks during this phase, but I wanted to make sure that he would land on his own first. I waited a very long time for him to get down, but he never did. It seems that Grigori has Alduin Syndrome and won't land unless you perform a very oddly specific gimmick. In the end, Water Girl resorted to the Ballista to shoot down Grigori, and the real fight had finally begun.
Grigori was dead, and I got a cool new shield from his flesh. My armor was also dragonforged, but my new shield wasn't. That needed to change. I went back to Bitter Black Isle, grabbed some rancid bait meat from a chest, and tried fighting a cursed dragon. That went about as well as expected. Cursed dragons have incredibly high dragonforge probability, but they're relatively strong to make up for it. If I collect 10 dragon scales, I can get my dragon's faith shield to 3 star enhancement. Then I'll have an 18% chance of getting a dragonforged when I kill a regular, lesser dragon. Cursed dragons are currently out of the question with my current equipment. Matthias sells dragon scales in post game. So I bought one and got Mounty Bank to triplicate it nine times, then enhanced my shield to three stars. Now I just need to dragon forge it. Bit of Black Isle has some consistent lesser dragon spawns, and unlike Grancers, they aren't massive pussies, so I don't need to worry about them flying away. I found a single drake in the rotunda of Dread. The battle was long and hard, just like my dick. Then a Saurian spat at me and I died, but I wasn't mad. The first kill didn't get me a dragon forge, but after an hour of reloading and killing this one drake over and over again, my shield was finally branded with the elusive red stamp. Dragon's Faith is the best magic shield you can get in the game without relying on RNG. That's why I was so determined to max it out. That being said, Silverforged and Goldforged enhancements require fire drake parts. We can fight normal drakes easily enough, but you have to at least defeat the Dark Bishop in order to encounter a fire drake. We're going to be stuck with Dragonforged enhancements for a while, and if this damage isn't good enough, then I'm fucked I guess. Watergirl is finally ready to fight the Gazer. The Gazer is always a difficult boss in these challenge runs, not because he's hard, but because a lot of upgrades are locked behind him. It's time for the moment of truth. We're spending all that time earning Dragon's Faith and getting a Dragon Forged worth it. Well, I guess not, because I still can't deal any damage to him. It doesn't actually matter in the end, though, because you can basically kill the Gazer at any level so long as you stay alive. The Gazer seems to enjoy piercing his own eye with a tentacle. While it's not up to us to judge him for his interests, it's the one thing that will let me take him. In a fight, all I have to do is stay alive and wait for him to slowly kill himself with his own tentacle. His tentacle doesn't deal that much damage, but as long as I don't die, we will eventually win. I put on one of my music playlists and got to standing still and holding the block button. After he attacked his eye, the gazer was dazed. There was nothing we could do during this time since attacking was banned. When he summoned his sigil, we couldn't attack the tentacles to dispel it, which is why I stood in the upper arena to avoid the explosion. The hardest part of this fight was not falling asleep, I I've already used that, but since I've never installed TikTok, I was able to get through it. The safest spot in the Gazer fight is the stairs. He won't summon tentacles on the ground, and you can block all his other attacks using Holy Fortress. This spell is a bit overkill in most situations, but because curatives are banned, Fortress helped me preserve my stamina. When the Gazer readied his tentacle attack, I'd run beneath him so he'd hit himself, which dealt a very small chunk of damage. It was simply a matter of repeating this for about 90 minutes straight until he eventually died. You want to know what the funniest part was? Because I never directly damaged the Gazer myself, killing him granted me no experience. At least he dropped an abyssal eye. Our next target was a bishop with a delicious weakness to dark magic. The Gazer took me 90 minutes, so I deserved to steamroll the next boss. The Dark Bishop was hard, I don't want to talk about it. Here's a clip of me doing pretty well before running into one of his necrotic chiz blobs and dying. Why can't he just use a sock like a normal person? The biggest problem with the bishop is when he merges with his dragon. If I kill the dragon during this phase, which is surprisingly difficult due to the buffs it receives, the bishop will lay on the floor and I can't do anything to it. So I chose to focus on staying alive and wait for the bishop to come out on his own. There was still a lot of unexpected deaths and I made sure to vent my frustrations in a healthy manner. But I kept trying and trying, until eventually, as the gamers put it, I popped off and managed to finally kill the bishop. <laughs> the two remaining bosses of this run are Damon and Damon. I skipped through the rest of the rooms until I reached the spy yard of Scant Mercy. A living armor is blocking the way, but gravity can take care of that. We entered the Fallen City. No enemies populate the area on your first visit. Watergirl looted the area as she pleased, trying to find as many roof crystals as possible for the grinding to come. This was the first time in the entire run that I ever felt so at peace, but beneath that, I was worried. I knew my shield wouldn't be strong enough to damage Damon. My magic stat was higher than his magic defense, but I didn't have faith in Blessed Repost. Ironically enough, I approached Damon, and just like that, my hunch was right. I don't do enough damage to bypass his magic defense threshold, resulting in zero damage being dealt. Blessed Repost has incredibly low magic scaling, and Damon's too resistant to the other elements. Dragon's Faith has run its course. Even if I were to Dragonforge it, it wouldn't be enough to damage Damon. 
Despite trying my best to avoid it, we're going to have to farm cursed weapons. Let's start off with farming level 2 weapons. The Forgotten Hall, Bloodless Stockade, Spy Yard of Scant Mercy, and the Fallen City was my go-to farming route. It took 7 purifications to get the Purge Buckler, which is honestly quite lucky, but how did I get the Rift Crystals needed to purify all that? From a different sky is a pretty common method for farming Rift Crystals, but there's another way to go about it. It involves making Garms die from full damage, but I just call it the Garm Farm. Using the Garm spawns in the Black Abbey, you can trick them into falling off the arena. When these Garms fall, their corpses would respawn in the center of the arena, letting me still get their Rift Crystal drops. Since killing Curse Dragons or Man Eaters for Rift Crystals wasn't very practical for this challenge, this was my next best option. If you're wondering why I'm not using XP boosters, it's because I forgot to. Since I was getting experience and discipline from this, I decided to swap to Sorcerer so I could get its vocation rank up. A reminder that non-shield wielding vocations are allowed, but I can't equip any weapons and can't attack anything. With this, I was able to gather plenty of Rift Crystals, Level Ups, and Vocation Ranks, purchasing some banging Sorcerer Augments. Now for materials. I need Poxy Flesh from Ogres, so I gravity kill a few of them. Idol of the All Mother is dropped by Corrupted Pawns, so I farm them in the Bloodless Stockade. Using the Poxy Flesh and Idols I farmed earlier, Purged Buckler is rarefied to Goldforge status. This earned me a Bloody Knuckle Ring, which has a hidden mechanic. On the surface, this ring doubles your unarmed damage. But if you have a shield equipped with no primary weapon, this damage bonus also applies to your shield. Unfortunately, this doesn't work for magic shields, only regular ones, so it's basically useless. After all this farming, hopefully I can actually deal damage to Damon now. You're my last hope, Purge Buckler. Thankfully, the Purge Buckler is strong enough to damage Damon. You might have noticed, however, that this damage is complete garbage. After several attempts, it consistently took 15 minutes to get Damon's health to 50%. This is normally when I die from something really bullshit. My damage needed to go higher. I got Mage to rank 2 and purchased Equanimity. This buffs my magic damage by 20% when my health is in the red. I'll have to deal with an annoying low health filter the whole time, but hopefully this damage boost is enough to kill Damon's first form. The Augment Sanctuary would also be great since it can keep me alive at low health, but I figured it would be too powerful and chose not to use it. After equipping Equanimity, my damage was way better, but there was one issue, a skill issue to be precise. Each attempt was 15 minutes at least, so the hours were piling up, and so were my mental health problems. My strategy consisted of sticking close to Damon to trigger his melee attacks. Blessed Riposte does the most damage by far if I can counter one of his physical attacks. After enough attempts, I got the perfect run and Damon was killed. With Damon's first form slain, we can now easily farm the strongest equipment in the whole game. Bitter Black Purifications are seeded, so I can't save Scum to get what I want. There are two equipment pieces I needed, the Diabolic Shield and Hellfire slash Sinner Gauntlets, with an enchantment that boosts shield damage. Farming these is going to be incredibly time consuming. That was a lie. I will just use a massive exploit instead. After killing Damon for the first time, we can now perform the infamous Damon glitch. This will drastically speed up the grind for level 3 equipment. I use a barrel to clip out of the entrance. I walked all the way back to the docks where Aura is. The walk back was very easy and I didn't die a single time. The next part isn't necessary for the bug to work, but I asked Aura to take me back to Cassidus since fairy stones and lift stones aren't working right now. I ran to the encampment and bought a secret of metamorphosis from Jonathan. This lets me customize my character anytime I want. I made Water Girl super tall and Fireboy super fat. I'll explain why later. For now, I run back to Damon's chambers to resume the glitch. Despite walking through the archway, Damon doesn't spawn. This means the glitch has worked perfectly and the level 3 equipment is ours for the taking. I barrel clip into the reward room and loot the chest for a level 3 weapon and level 3 armor piece. Because Water Girl is taller, it will be much easier performing the barrel clip now. You then exit Damon's room again and walk back in, loot the chests, leave, go back in, loot the chests, and you can do this as many times as you want. Whenever my inventory got full, I'd summon Fireboy and make him hold my very legitimately acquired earnings. Since I made him really fat, he's able to carry a bunch of stuff without getting encumbered. And if you think using Fireboy to hold my stuff for this one part of the challenge run is in violation of my no pawns rule, then I hope you die. I spent the next several hours looting Damon's chests until I had plenty of level 3 armors. And if you're upset that I used a massive exploit to farm my equipment, then fuck you. Grow up. Doing this glitch managed to get me quite a lot of rift crystals, but I wasn't certain it was going to be enough if my luck turned out really bad. I had two options, keep farming for rift crystals, which is boring and doesn't make for an interesting video, or use pawn rentals to get millions of rift crystals and skip the grind entirely. 
While the rental method is not cheating because it's an intended mechanic, it does sort of break my no pawns rule, which is why I went to the viewers and asked if they were okay with me using rentals to get rift crystals, and you guys said yeah just use rentals so I guess I'll just use rentals. The pawn on my main save file Chalk Lord is a bit of a celebrity. By sleeping online, all the RC he's accrued went straight into my pockets. A lot of people also gave Chalk Lord many high value gifts. While I appreciate the sentiment, I won't be using them for the sake of the challenge run. We finally get the Diabolic Shield after a couple of purifications and the shield boosting gauntlets soon after. I actually got quite lucky with purifications and there was no need to use rentals in the first place. The 400k RC I got from the Daemon glitch was enough to get what I needed. Now that we've gotten the necessary items, it's time to fix the Daemon glitch. This can be done easily by walking out the back door of his chambers. Doing so reverts Bitter Black back to normal and Daemon will start spawning again. I kill a Fire Drake with my new toys to get them Dragon Forged. There was one problem with the Diabolic Shield however, we can't kill Death because none of his attacks are blockable, which means we can't get the scythe shard needed to goldforge diabolic shield. So silver is the highest it can go. And seeing as how we have a goldforged purge buckler already, it was at this point that I realized a silverforged diabolic shield is weaker than a goldforged purge buckler, and I wasted all that time farming it for no reason. Our final task is to confront Damon again so we can kill his second form. We're going to need some new augments first. I rank up assassin a few times with gravity farming, I purchase bloodlust. This increases my damage by 20% if it's night time. Then I started lethally perfect blocking the guards in Grand Soren to reach rank 9, finally unlocking autonomy for another 20% damage boost. This applies while I'm playing solo. I can now get rid of equanimity and play with max health without compromising on damage. Next, I equip the nether helmet I got while doing the daemon glitch. It says it increases your strength, but it also increases your magic. This buffs our damage depending on how many enemies are present. Since we're just fighting Damon, a single enemy, it will be a 5% damage buff. That may not sound like much, but I am very desperate. My magic damage has increased by more than 600 this time around, which should be enough. Once you've killed Damon for the first time, every enemy in BBI is skippable. It was a simple matter of sprinting through the whole labyrinth until I reached Damon's lair again. Damon's first form completely melts to my parries, and while his second form is much tankier, killing him is possible. The problem with Bloodlust is that it deactivates past 5am. My damage is still okay, but the battle gets harder the longer it goes. I was playing extremely cautiously. I wasn't going for any stylish parries, didn't try perfect blocking really dangerous spells. Each attempt took a long time, but I parried on, playing carefully even though it made me look like a pussy. These several grueling hours made me well acquainted with Alt F4, but after parrying and dodging him for almost 40 minutes straight, I finally got the perfect run. Yes! Yes! Holy shit. <laughs> oh, fuck. It's time to kill the Seneschal and finish this run already. The Seneschal is a very easy fight, but he's got some weird gimmicks. I meet up with Quince and give her 20 wake stones. Hold on, Cringe. When did you get those 20 wake stones? Back when I was doing the Daemon glitch to farm BBI armors, I picked up the wake stones that spawn near Daemon's throne each time until I had 20 of them. After handing them in, the portal opens and we can murder the Seneschal. I perfect blocked him once and he died. Then I perfect blocked him once again and he died. Then he shows his true form and Fireboy is called into the fight, despite being only level 3. He immediately dies. The Seneschal can't be killed unless he's grappled, which requires both you and your pawn to work together. Since pawns are banned, I wanted to see if there was a workaround. Blessed Riposte leaves orbs on the ground that deal damage. The idea was that I used Blessed Riposte, grappled the Seneschal, and then he dies to the orbs. This didn't work, because the Seneschal has to do his constipation crouch attack in order to be grappled. Blessed Riposte freezes an entity's animation, so he never triggers this attack until after the spell dissipates. I tried to perfect block this massive attack, and that didn't work either. Looks like we'll have to do this the boring way, the way that forces me to break a rule. I actually don't care, the Seneschal's a goofy fight, you can't make me care about it. My fucking game, my game. No. <laughs> my fucking game crashed, bro. Oh, can I just say it's done now? Can I? Like, I can, right? Like, I, I killed the Seneschal, all right? Like, let's just say I'm, I'm done. I'm not. F fuck that. Oh, it seems the parry only challenge run has come to a close. Did this run provide a satisfactory level of challenge? Yes. Would I do it again? No. Once again, thank you Raid for sponsoring the video. I'll see you guys in whatever the next one is.